hi, how are you? And welcome to another podcast by George. Well, you hear me say it all the time, and I'm, but I'm asked all the time, so I'll explain it one more time, why I do these podcasts. And I'm just an average regular guy that has some very modest skills in some areas, and some people would even debate that. But I got a lot of friends that are really talented and really skilled, and today we get to talk to another one, and that's another big reason to do the podcast. I get to share this uh, talent that my friends have, and then I get to sit down and visit with folks like Dwight Dario, who's going to be the guest today on a podcast by George, the PBG, as I'm starting to call it. And uh, I'm just tickled to death because uh, the musicians that we've had on here to four are the guys that kind of dominate the uh, blues and and rock scene, the the guitar players, I mean, the singer, songwriter, guitar players. But Dwight's a drummer, and he's just, he's not just a drummer. The guy's not an average drummer. This guy has got uh, the pedigree. He's got well, what they call the bona fides. I, I, I love that word, bona fides. Check that out. It's Latin-based, and look that up in your thor- thesaurus. But when I think of uh, Dwight Dario, I think of uh, bona fides. Uh, a great drummer. I get to watch him all the time. I don't know, Dwight, when I see you uh, behind the drum kit, the guy that I'm reminded of maybe more, more than anybody, and it's a, a compliment, obviously, but I think it's well-deserved, Charlie Watts. I love Charlie Watts. Yeah, and yeah. you know something about Charlie Watts and uh, the Rolling Stones. Or what, maybe we'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, all but, right. <laughs> all but right. I mean, this is part of the story that, that this guy has, and it's great. But Charlie is described as a, I don't know, a lot of times they call him a, a jazz drummer. What's that mean to you, a, a jazz drummer? What is that? Well, it, you know, it, it's kind of a big term. Jazz, a lot of it means improvisation and on, you know, on the spot, making stuff up. And jazz is very much like that. So, you know, blues has a lot of that in it, too. Yeah. And my approach is similar. Yeah. I I tend to play off of what everybody else is playing or take them somewhere that I want to go. Yeah. Uh, And uh, with the blues and with the people that I've been able to play with... It's worked out quite well. You know, Charlie just sits back there, and and as for as, as big as the Rolling Stones is, he's got a, a a smaller drum kit. But the thing about the guy is, I um and I've read this in interviews too. He's perfect. The guy oh, is yeah. perfect. I saw it one time when they said when the Stones go into the recording studio, which they're getting older, they don't do that much anymore. But when they used to, when guys would lay down tracks or do certain parts, they would sometimes use some automation, use a drumulator or a you know, a, an automated uh, drum sound. Not with Charlie. They would always use him because he <laughs> he was perfect all the time. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, spot on. I, I thought that I thought that was great. Well, right, let, let's read Dwight's uh, bio. This stuff is, is really good. Uh, drummer and New Jersey native Dwight Dario first came to Iowa in 1974, where he spent time playing in the Mother Blues Band. I remember that band. The Third Street Siders with uh, Bo Ramsey, the Rocket 88s, the Little Red Rooster Band, Bob Reedy. Is it Bob Reedy? Reedy. Reedy. Okay, Bob Reedy's Chicago Blues Show with uh, Johnny Little John and in a duo with fellow Hall of Famer Joe Price. Dwight left Iowa in 1984 and after a brief stint in Arizona with Texas Red and the uh, Heartbreakers, where he played with Hans Olsen and uh, Geneva Magnus, he settled in the uh, Twin Cities. He spent five years with Blues Deluxe with uh, R.J. Michaud, yeah. uh, during which he was named blues, uh, Best Blues Drummer by the Minnesota Music Association in 1988, 89, and 1990, and that's no small task, folks. They got some, they got some talent up there in the cities. And then 14 years with the Big George Jackson Blues Band, with whom he toured Europe 12 times. Dwight moved to Des Moines in 2011. God, were the guys down here happy to see him? And uh, he's playing uh, with lots of folks down here, including the likes of uh, Heath Allen, the Soul Searchers, Bob Pace, uh, Matt Woods, and Rod Lombard. So. I remember when they first told me that you were from New Jersey, and then you left there in 1974. Well, there were some pretty spectacular things happening in, in New Jersey back in 74. Most notably, a guy named Bruce Springsteen was just starting to break yep. out up there in Southside, Johnny, and, and all those guys. Did, did, you get, um, did you have any experience there with that, with that genre? Or? Uh, not really, not with any of those people in particular. Yeah. Um, I, I knew some people that were around them, but I didn't yeah. know any of them at all. And uh, um, I had uh, was in the process at that point of 
of uh, relocating to Arizona for my first time. And I went down there and would go back and forth from Arizona to New Jersey. And this friend of mine, also from New Jersey, he knew somebody in Iowa City. So we'd always stop in Iowa City on the way back and forth from New Jersey. Yeah, great town. It was great. Well, um, these guys that my friend knew happened to be Bo Ramsey. Yeah. And uh, I would sit in with the band. And my friend Tom Albany's would he's a harp player. He would sit in with the band. And eventually I got the call from Bo. He said, you know, our drummer's leaving. Uh, do you wanna, would you like to come up and join us? Yeah. And, uh, man, best thing I ever did. <laughs> best thing I ever did. Yeah. Well, that's where this, that's where these bona fides uh, start. Uh, Bo Ramsey, what a, what a great musician. So, all right, and you're uh, in Iowa uh, for the first time in, in 1974, you know, playing uh, with uh, the Third Street Sliders and uh, Bo Ramsey, the Rocket 88's uh, Mother Blues Band, and uh, a duo with fellow Hall of Famer Joe Price. But, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, you left Iowa in 1984 and went to Arizona, and you lived down there full-time? I did. I lived down there for just for a short time. Yeah. Um, when I left here, there was no work for anyone. It was really tough. And I had a family, and uh, there was plenty of work in Arizona. So um, I moved my family down to Arizona, and we stayed for a few years and just hated it. Really? Hated living there. Like you know, like the idea of it all. Yeah. But I didn't. I didn't like it. Yeah. And uh, set our sights on, on uh, Minnesota, and so we eventually just moved on up there. And, and well, what was the music scene like down there in Arizona? Yeah. Well, I mean, the music scene was okay. There was a lot of good players, but there everybody was coming and going. It was very okay. transient at that time. Yeah. Uh, so you get you know in working with someone, and then next thing you know, they're going back to Brooklyn or. You know, they're going back to California. So it, a lot of people came and went, and, and uh, just uh, it didn't feel good. And we, uh, we'd, we didn't really like the desert, and uh, we liked the, mid, the Midwest a whole lot more. And at that time, there was a huge scene going on in Minneapolis. Yeah, everybody uh, thinks of the blues, and they think, uh, you know, they think of— Memphis, you know, as an yeah. example, Chicago, obviously, um, Kansas City has uh, the, uh, that great blue scene. Minneapolis doesn't need to take a back seat to anybody. I mean, absolutely my, not. Yeah. There, there was a just a huge pool of of blues players and and roots players that that um, were there and still are there. Um, a lot of people got their start there. A lot of people got their end there. You know, a lot, a lot of the older folks from. Chicago or uh, or uh, Memphis and stuff did end up in Minneapolis at some point because it was you could work yeah and you could make some money and there was the, more importantly people came out to see the music yeah they came out and saw you and yeah. they, you know so it was really good that way so there's a lot of good players some of these southern blues guys real southern guys like Delta guys I remember reading BB uh, King's uh, biography and he said you know why'd you end up in Memphis he said, well I didn't want to go to Chicago. <laughs> they called that the, the hawk or the, you said it was too cold. Yeah. I mean, for him, he he was yeah. from Indianola, Mississippi. I love yeah. that. Indianola, Mississippi. And he said, man, Memphis was as far north as I wanted to go. Yeah. So if you go to Minneapolis, you got to be able to tolerate the weather. Oh, but, yeah. but the music scene and the blues back then, when the rest of the country maybe was, you know, into some other things that were breaking out at the time, the blues were as hot and as good in, in Minneapolis as they were anywhere. What was your game like at this time? When you hit the deck in Minneapolis, uh, how do you feel about um, your skill set? Oh, I felt pretty good because I'd yeah. been working a lot. Yeah. So you know, I'd, I I felt good, uh, and I met um, R.J. Michaud right off the bat. Yeah, yeah. And uh, R.J. and I hit it off, and uh, he had a little band called Blues Deluxe, and um, uh, they were looking for a drummer at that time. So I said, Yeah, you bet. So I joined up with him, and we played, you know, all over the Upper Midwest and and around the Twin Cities metro area, of course, uh, for quite some time. Um, and at that time, too, you know, we played all of us just like it is here. We played with other bands and other people that were in town as well. So um, it was real healthy that way. Yeah, you know. Well, let's let's pick up a song that you uh, played on with, with R.J. 
Uh, so we can get some music in here right off the top. Uh, this song, uh, a lot of people are going to recall Muddy Waters when they listen to this. Uh, Bird's Nest on the Ground. With RJ, listen for the drums in here. Dwight's uh, on the kit. Listen to this, um, and we'll come right back. So that's R.J. Michaud and Bird's Nest on the Ground and it handled the vocals on that. You worked with a lot of great harmonica players, and R.J. is oh, yeah. a, a perfect example of that. I, I mean, it, it's an integral part of the blues, but um, I, you could make an argument that some of the best uh, harmonica players that ever pick one up came out of the cities. I, they're great up there. Yeah, for some reason, there's, there's, a, there, there's some good players up yeah. there, good harp players. Uh, and R.J. was... Uh, he's one of the best and and he was very active and and you know like wanted to make it go yeah you know and uh i really enjoy playing with him i still do you know we still you know back him up when he comes through town and stuff so yeah it's, it's so what kind of venues are you playing up there are you playing bars in the cities are you traveling around minnesota in the well, winter i mean that's oh, a, sure we yeah. were you know <laughs> yeah we're playing that's a near-death experience sometimes yeah. i mean yeah yeah you uh, know weather we, good lord yeah we, we had a we had a every monday night jam spot at uh, the whiskey junction down on the west bank minneapolis yeah. and then we're, and that's right next door to the caboose which we played occasionally too and five corners bar and and um the viking bar 400 bar yeah. um any number of places that were would open this week and close next we'd play them yeah you know and uh so yeah there was a lot of places a lot uh, of places to play a lot of nice stages and we played a lot of festivals too yeah so that was fun so move this uh, timeline along for us now. So uh, you're uh, playing with, with RJ and, and others too? Yeah, we're, like I said, it's like similar to uh, the Des Moines scene. I mean, there's a lot of players, a lot of different bands. So, you know, you get a call and say, hey, you want to play with, uh, you know, Billy and me on Saturday night? Well, yeah, sure. You know, if I was open, I'd go play. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we're playing with a lot of people. And, uh, um and then eventually, I guess it was the mid '90s. I guess early to mid '90s, R.J. decided he was moving away. He'd had enough of the cold. Yeah, and he moved to San Francisco. Um, and about that same time, so you know, the the band more or less fell apart at that point. Um, and I took a gig on the road with Guitar Junior. Um, which turned out to be a quite a disaster. <laughs> um, and I got back from that tour, um, owing more money than I made. Uh, it happens, um, yeah. and, uh, I had decided at that point that, that I was going to take a break and I put the sticks down for a couple of years. I just, I just worked, you know, and, and I didn't, uh, didn't play at all. And then I got a call one night from big George, yeah. uh, um, big George Jackson, and I didn't know him at all. I mean, I knew who he was, but I didn't, never met him or anything. And he said, well, man, I'm putting together this little this little band, it's real real laid back. We're going to play over at Pepito's Mexican Restaurant over in Minneapolis there on Monday nights from 7 to 9.30, pay you 50 bucks and, and dinner. He said, we're not rehearsing, we're just going over there and playing. And to me at that point, it was great. It was like, there's no pressure here. There's no com huge commitment to do anything. Yeah, yeah, I didn't yeah. have to go anywhere. Yeah. And uh, it was amazing, right? Right from the get-go, that band just gelled. Yeah, it clicked. It clicked. I, I love Big George. Well, for one thing, he's named George. They called my dad Big George. <laughs> I, and I love that part of it. I mean, the, the guy's got... Uh, a voice like sweet molasses. I mean, honest to God. And a lot of people are like, well, I've never heard of this guy. Well, maybe you do. TV, like yeah. George. Yeah. He's got a um, he's got a song uh, that was on uh, the Sons of 
Anarchy. Yeah, if I could change, got on Son, uh, Sons of Anarchy. Um, also, just five years ago, um, another song off that same record, Big Shot, uh, was on The Good Wife. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And it's, there's been uh, a number of other places yeah. where George's songs have, have been part of TV and movie soundtracks. So well, it's been pretty they're cool. great songs. I'm going to pick up some of them and, and uh, stick them in here just for so folks uh, can, can hear it. But also, they might ring a bell with you if you're a if you're a TV viewer too. You might recognize this. Let's start off with the "If I Could Change." This is the Big George Jackson Blues Band. Lifetime of bad habits, baby. It's such a hard thing to stop. Okay, so that's if I could change. So is that just dumb luck, or how do television shows happen to pick up somebody like Big George? How did he wander into that, to where those songs were being used? Well, uh, to, we put out three CDs uh, with George on the Black and Tan record label. They're based in Appledorn, Holland. And so they're the ones that got, got it going through their management and their agencies. Yeah. They actively pursue that stuff. And they love this guy in Europe. He oh, was, yeah. You it guys was, spent more time in Europe than you did over here almost. It, yeah. it was great over yeah. there. You know, we kept going. They kept asking us. They and they kept buying CDs. And then um, we loved it. I mean, we had a great time over there. Yeah. No, great. Well, the other song, again, that we mentioned that also found its way onto uh, television from the uh, Good Wife uh, TV show. This is Big Shot. Let's check a little of it. It's all good. Listen to this. Again, I'm uh, just trying to keep a visual on on the timeline here. What are we talking about time wise? When are you playing with Big George? Um, Mid '90s yeah. is when we started, um, and we continued uh, till about 2010, really playing together. Uh, George just got tired. Um, oh, he's a big man. He's a big man. He worked hard, and he just couldn't take the road anymore. You know, and, and we were going to Europe a lot because that's where our primary audience was where we could actually um you know make a difference and he just couldn't do it anymore so he you know he retired from his job and said I'm staying home boys um man so voice from God honestly oh God yeah what what a singer holy cow yeah and just just a, a an amazing human being he's just a great man yeah yeah. I want to before we leave move out of the uh, Minneapolis scene. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the guys that I'm familiar with that we've had on the podcast already. Uh, Pat Hayes and yeah. uh, Bruce McCabe, the Lamont Cranston and and the Hoop Snake guys up there. They're moving around at the same time that you are. They crossing are. paths, playing in the same places yep. and uh, Bruce plays with everyone. Yeah. Um yeah, I pl- I played with Bruce. I've known Bruce for a very long time. Um he also he played with RJ from time to time. Um and he did a tour with Big George. Um, there was one one European tour, and Phil Schmidt was him and his wife were having a baby, and he couldn't go on tour. So Bruce filled in for for Phil on that tour. So it was great to have to play with him for you know two yeah. months. Yeah, I mean I, I I love the guy. Obviously, we just saw him up in uh, the cities. He's not in good health still. I mean, no, uh, he's I hanging in there. It's a shame. I mean, yeah, it's tra- tra- and uh. You got to give a shout out to you. Uh, talk to Jim Novak up there briefly, <laughs> and Jim says, "Hi, you know he's living down in Arizona." Yeah, he's going. He's been there for a while. Yeah, and, yeah. and he's working at a dude ranch. Yeah. So when you were in Arizona, you didn't work at a dude ranch, did you? 
<laughs> no, I actually, I had a, I, my day job then was painting warehouses, believe it or yeah, not. Yeah, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah. Well, Minneapolis is a great place. I lived up there briefly. I really like it. I don't know, something about it. I love the people. I love, um, oddly enough, if you live up there, you get to where you like the winters uh, sometimes because people up there enjoy their winters. I mean, they kind of look forward to it. They're guys that ice fish, uh, they snowmobile, they uh, play hockey. I mean, uh, and, you know, the bar scene, you're indoors. I mean, uh, driving up there can be be an issue. But, yeah, I really liked it um, and kind of miss it in, in some ways. But in 2011, 2011 you pick up and, and come down here. Uh, as I, you know, stayed here, of course, I got to know, you know, a whole bunch of different people, um, different musicians and stuff. And, and I just loved it. And I said, well, okay, yeah. I'm here. Yeah. I'm here. Well, you're, you're a guy that, that can be counted on. Your drumming is outstanding. No mistakes, in the pocket, in the groove, knows all this great music. Again, I'm reminded of Charlie Watts or another, you know, these are big names. Everybody, Ringo Starr was often described as the same way. But people say, well, you know, that, that, he's not John Bonham. He's not Keith Moon. Well, uh, those are different kind of drummers, different genres. I mean, yeah. you, you, you don't want, those guys were part of the big show, really. You're the kind of drummer that sits back there and, maybe just makes it so that the guys out front can get the attention that uh, they're there for. In just a very short period of time, you get acknowledged in the Iowa Blues Hall of Fame. Now, are, are you in a Blues Hall of Fame in Minnesota also? Or? Uh, no. You know? I, um, when I was up there, there was no Blues Society up there or, or Blues Hall of Fame. Um, so now they're, you know, they're starting to do stuff up there, but I'm not a member of that. Um, there was the Mus Minnesota Music Association. That was it. Um, and when I got down here, uh, yeah, I got inducted, and and uh, it was it was like I didn't see it coming. <laughs> uh, well, you've got the bona fides. I mean, you look at this resume, you look at the pedigree, and it's great. But I look at it and think I can see why the guys in Iowa would want him in, but I can see why the guys up in Minnesota would too. But they, <laughs> did, they didn't have the mechanism. They didn't have right, the blue yeah. society to yeah uh, to take care of that. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, that's great stuff. So, you know, um, Matt Woods has been on the podcast. He's great. We've got some of his music up there. And uh, another great friend of ours that's uh, on frequently, and his music will be heard at the beginning of the end of the show when you hear that what we call bumper music that opens and closes the show. That's Bob Pace. Oh, yeah. Yeah, tell, tell us about playing with Bob. Oh, it's great. You know, I, um, Bob's just a fantastic player. And I uh, got to know Bob shortly also after I, I moved down here and, Started playing pickup gigs with with him, uh, and uh, uh, eventually, uh, a couple things happened. We we uh, sort of stumbled upon Butter Cow Blues Band. Um, Bob had had gotten this regular gig at at Lefties once a month, yep. and and called a bunch of guys, and and uh, I was one of them, and. It stuck, so we continue with that. And then also two years ago, Bob and I decided we were going to enter the Iowa Blues Challenge as a duo. Bare bones. Bare bones, exactly. Uh, so we worked up a bunch of songs, and uh, we won Iowa, and we went down to Memphis and had a great time, and didn't win, but we had a great experience. And yeah. uh, and I think that putting that together with Bob. Um, we both got to know each other musically and personally a lot closer because we rehearsed and which is something we don't, I don't do a lot of. Right. Right. Um, and, uh, it's just, it makes playing with him for me anyway, it makes playing with him, you know, that much more of an experience because I know how he's playing. I, I, I know his tells and I can, you know, kind of read them a little bit, um, and that, that's always fun. Well, it's the beauty of your skill set and, and yeah. experience to be able to do that. And I, and I look at you now, and I think and we're, um, we're in the basement of your home now. These, uh, this has got to be some of the best years of your life. I mean, it's and cool. I feel that way, too. I mean, you got a beautiful home, a beautiful wife. You're playing the music you want to play with great musicians here. you got the day job that's working out, so you're not starving to death. You're not going from yeah. gig to gig <laughs> looking for a few bucks here and there. I mean, this is all pretty good stuff. It's it's great stuff. I, I've, I, you know, I've not been in a better place in my life. Right now is, is just great. Like you said, you know, uh, my wife and is just wonderful and we got a nice nice home and 
I'm I'm playing I, a lot. Yeah, you know, frankly, and but there's a reason. And, for, I mean, these musicians, folks, are they're all very very modest. Dwight is great. I'm I'm telling you something. This guy is really good. Before I let you off the hook here, before we get away on this, because I uh, prefaced it, tell us about this Stones thing. Uh, you've got some <laughs> connection or knowledge. What is that? Well, my day job is, is like I said, I, producing concerts, festivals, and stuff like that. And back in the late 80s, um, I was uh, doing a lot of big outdoor shows and um, ran across some people and blah, blah, blah. And uh, Steel Wheels Tour was getting ready uh, to go out on the road. They were starting their rehearsals, and they wanted to put a team together, a production team that had experience with big outdoor and stadium shows, which I had that experience. And uh, I got the call. I was actually, I was in uh, Dallas doing a Taste of Texas. And I got the call uh, to, uh, you know, show up in Toronto, meet with them, and I got hired to as one of several site coordinators for the Stones, and I spent two years on on steel wheels, um, you know, moving it from city to city in the United States. I didn't do any of the European stuff. but Yeah. So did you interact with the players much? Oh, yeah. You, so tell us. I mean, well, I, you know, Charlie Watts was, at, at that particular time, was intimately involved with the stage design. He so, was, yeah. He yeah. Designed, those guys all have art backgrounds. They do, so yeah, yeah. They do. He so he designed that that set and everything, and often he would when we were you know building it. And back then, you know, it took you know a week, ten days to build that thing. Nowadays, you do it too, but yeah, you know. So you're there for a long time, and he would show up and and talk to me and everybody. Um, you know, about how things were going and what we could change and if we could do this a little bit different and how much money yeah. would that cost. And, yeah, that's a, you know, and, I love the guy. You talk about, again, modest. I mean, this Charlie Watts guy. There's two things I know that always uh, strike me about uh, Charlie Watts. Now, number one, he's very British. Oh, yeah. Yeah, people forget that. I mean, they think, oh, we're the Stones, we we all, no, they're British. And Charlie's the most British of the band, maybe. I mean, every time. The other thing of it is, the dude can't drive. No. He doesn't drive anywhere. No. You know, you got to think about the fact that the, the the band formed on the streets maybe when they were younger or whatever, and he's been in the back of a limo ever since then. He's got collector cars because he's a multi-jillionaire. He goes out and buys all... He can't drive them. No. I, the guy not only doesn't drive, he can't drive. No, no, <laughs> I, he can't. I think, I think that's something else. So, yeah. yeah. And did he, he knows your drummer. I mean, you guys talk drumming? Oh, a little bit. Mo- mostly, it, it was business then. You yeah. Know, it was, really was. And, and um, so we didn't really discuss drums yeah. very very often. He's in his glass cage a lot when they play. What is that thing? That, uh, oh, uh, he doesn't do that anymore. No. But it was um, an attempt to isolate uh, the mic. Booth, yeah. The, yeah. And he would, uh, was the set list visible to him on that glass or something? I've seen no. some DVDs or something. It looked like there was some type or something that was showing. Uh, he, no? No, he would just stick okay. it on there with a piece of tape. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, I didn't they're know very, they're very casual. Yeah, you know, so uh, they, and they were all very nice to me and, yeah. and nice to everybody. I didn't didn't see see any kind of weird rock star nonsense. Well, with them. this was still a party era, particularly with uh, Keith Richards. I mean, did you see large volumes of alcohol and other things consumed by these guys at that time? No, 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 not uh, really. Uh, no. There, a, a lot of it is stories. Yeah, um, I'll give you one. Uh, Keith Richards always wanted a bottle a fifth of rebel yell bourbon in his dressing room and so he could always get him one and basically he would open it and pour a drink and that would be it he wouldn't even drink it so whatever else he was doing i don't know but i never saw a lot of that stuff yeah you know i didn't those guys were were i mean to do that show that they were doing was crazy they so they had to be in shape they can't be just you know out and out alcoholic yeah. drug addicts and pull that off right so all these runways and catwalks yep. and all this stuff that these guys uses they use on those stages you were involved in that i, mean, I was involved in 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 the uh, uh my title was site coordinator so i would uh basically go into a venue um and figure out how to get this thing in there um and and build it and then 
coordinate with the local authorities and security and all that sort of stuff. Um, and, uh, and the staging company would, would basically, you know, tell me what they could fit in there. And mm. there was three different sets that were out with this thing. So one small, medium, and large, basically. Two years. Two years. Yeah. 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 You like it? I did then. Yeah. Yeah, I did then. You know, it was it was good. It was good. It was a great experience. Well, it's about time for us to to clock out. These uh, podcasts normally last, uh, you know, anywhere from twenty minutes to thirty minutes. We're uh, it looks like we're quite a bit past that, but that means it's a good one because there's a lot of great <laughs> things. I mean, I, this is great talking to Dwight and. Um, you know, talking about the drums and, and these great bands. Anything I didn't ask about that people should, you know, should know about you or maybe even the, the uh, art. Uh, okay, so I know I know one drum joke. Okay, you want to hear, hear Just my... Just one. Yeah, here's, here's my <laughs> drum joke. Maybe this is an old joke. Maybe you've heard this. But what the... You can finish it if, you, if you've heard this. But uh, let's see how this goes. So what, um, what did the drummer name his twin daughters? Oh, I don't know. And a one and a two. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that that's all I that's all that's all I got for for a joke. I wanted to make sure that I got that in there. I didn't forget to tell that cornball joke. But what what haven't I asked that I probably should have? You know, the biggest thing for me is is, um, you know, have a good time at it, play from the heart. That's it. I mean, yeah. If you don't do that, you might as well not. And you do, and and if uh, folks uh, want to check him out, he's uh, playing with a lot of different combos and groups and stuff because everybody wants him because he's rock solid and he's uh, great. He's very modest and he's uh, he's my friend, and he's uh, a drummer guest. And I'm I'm glad that he's uh, been here with us today. And I want to encourage folks, uh, everybody that wants to check out the podcast, uh, light it up. I mean, go to. Um, podcastbygeorge.com check us out on facebook you can uh, get us on on twitter and uh, iheart radio app and uh, spotify uh, google play i mean it's amazing the number of places that the uh, podcast is available and we need all the uh, growth that we can get so everybody check out the podcast and thanks to dwight dario my buddy my pal and another guest on a podcast by george <laughs>